Hi guys, this is Onya. I'm back and I plan on making videos on a more regular basis. I just want to let you guys know that my YouTube channel has finally been monetized. It was previously monetized with ads back in 2018. However, YouTube changed their policy of, of the minimum requirements for becoming monetized, becoming a channel that you can put ads on your videos for. So they required, they changed their requirements to have a thousand subscribers at least, and at least 4,000 hours of, of watching the videos, your, your videos um, in total of all the viewers for the course of the last 12 months. And I reached that threshold at the beginning of 2019 in January, at the very end of January, roughly around. And in the beginning of February, I was notified by YouTube that they couldn't make a decision and they had to they had to further review it and but they did not give me a timeline of when that would be so I waited and it was all the way till June last month when I received another email that said they still need more time to review the video and they haven't made a decision yet. Well, earlier today I found out that they made the decision and they finally decided to monetize my YouTube channel. So going forward, I am going to be putting ads into, into my videos. Now, I can't control what ads appear in the videos, so if there are any, vi if there are any ads which are which conflict with your values or make you uncomfortable, then it's my apologies. Um, I can't I can't control that. And basically I don't necessarily endorse whatever ads are on my videos. That being said, I I decided to monetize it because I really feel like this is my calling in life is to do my minute my ministry to people. And right now I'm limited to working a regular job, which is basically nine to five. I mean, it's not nine to five for me. It's it's seven to three thirty, but it's essentially a nine to five job. You know that phrase, nine to five job. So basically, that's what I need to do right now for my finances. Eventually, if I get enough income from my ministry, I can start doing part time for my for my job. And then maybe eventually somewhere down the road I can just stop working the regular office type of job uh, altogether. I might be able to do that. So now I don't uh, think I'm allowed to tell you to uh, basically don't here's the thing um, if you watch too many ads, it could potentially um, cause a problem. So don't go out of your way to watch ads to try to help me, because that could actually harm my channel significantly. So don't do that. But basically all I ask is that if you see something in the ad that interests you, then engage with it. Feel free to engage with it. Whether we you know what, whatever your heart's desire is. Um, so yeah, and uh, if you want to help me financially, there are many ways you can. You can send me money directly um, via Google Mail or Facebook, or we could. There, there are other alternatives to send money to donate for my ministry. I did. I was trying to do Patreon for a while. And I might set up a Patreon account in the future again. I do have one, but I'm thinking I might set up a new one um, 
or maybe revamp the current one that I have because uh, right now I'm not really utilizing the account and I have been finding that Patreon isn't really an ideal way to make money. You can make a good amount of money through Patreon, but you lose a lot of good money too. You lose a percentage, a significant percentage of the money that someone's donating to you. So to avoid that, you could donate directly to a person and they will receive 100%. That sounds much better. Like if you want to send someone $100, would you rather them get the $100 or would you rather them only receive $90 and some random third party takes 10 of your dollars and keeps it for themselves? That's not really ideal. So that's why I prefer not to use Patreon, but I might set it up as a alternative in case some people just prefer the convenience of Patreon, even though it will take a per percentage of what they're sending. If they if that's what they prefer, I can set that up. And as I said, there are other ways to send money. We can I can discuss with people who want to send money um, what method they want to use. We can discuss that. But anyways, so I'm not doing this for the money, obviously. Um, I simply would like to be able to do this without the hindrances of full-time job and because I want to do this ministry full-time I want to be able to put in my my effort to really fully move forward with with what needs to be moved forward with so now with that said I'm going to discuss the aspects of my YouTube channel that I think are valuable for you to consider basically as I'm sure many of you viewers are aware I have two main goals. One is to make my version of the Bible, and the second is to restore the religion of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, it is my position that the Dead Sea Scrolls religion was um, the, the people who had that religion were none other, none other than the Essenes. Now, I know some scholars disagree with that, but that is my current uh, conclusions. And I really it doesn't really matter what you call them as long as you're talking about the same group so the group that we know as the Essenes I believe there's sufficient evidence to link them with the Dead Sea Scrolls religion now further on that point what happened to the Essenes what happened to the Dead Sea Scrolls religion where did it go it disappeared well in my view the reason it disappeared was because it transformed into a successor and that would be, in my view, Christianity, the early Christianity. Because early Christianity was very heavily Jewish and um, incorporated a lot of the Essene ideas. In fact, I think it, it, there's enough evidence to prove that the early Christian movement was a Essene offshoot, basically a revised or reformed Essene type of religion based on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, now, there were there were a lot of changes throughout Christianity over time, so that now Christianity is very dissimilar to the Dead Sea Scrolls religion in general. However, in the 5th century, the there was a schism. Many of you know the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s and thereabouts. I can't remember the exact date for the Protestant Reformation, but uh, you, you know of that, and you also know of, many know of the Great Schism, which divided the Eastern Orthodox Church from the Catholic Church. However, a lot fewer people are aware of the earlier schism that happened with the Council of Chalcedon, which was rejected, rightfully so, by the true believers. True believers rejected the Council of Chalcedon, and because of that, they were they mutually excommunicated each other. So at that point, the Catholic Church separated from the Oriental Orthodox, and the Catholic Church at that point became the Roman Catholic Church, and then. 
because it was uh, centralized with Rome, and and then eventually, of course, the Roman Catholic Church split up into Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, so, but so, anyways, within the Oriental Orthodoxy, there are there is a huge percentage of Oriental Orthodox which have preserved a large amount of a scene Dead Sea Scroll religion type elements in their Christianity. That cannot be coincidence. They have books that are elsewhere found only in the Dead Sea Scrolls, such as Jubilees and Enoch, for example. And there's just so many other elements. Some of their extra books in their New Testament have doctrines which are found elsewhere only in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essene religion ideas, such as communism, uh, like as you see in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4, the Essenes believed that that was required, and not just a voluntary idea, but everyone in the group who was who was joined to the true group had to do it. And likewise, these extra books in the Essene Bible, oh, excuse me, in the Ethiopian Bible, they, in their New Testament, they have these same communism ideas, as we see in Acts chapter 2 and in chapter 4, which the Essenes did, which sharing all their possessions. Also, a three-year conversion process that is found in that that is found in the uh, that that is found in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. The Josephus describes the Essenes as having a three-year uh, process, and it is also found in these extra books of the Ethiopian Bible. Uh, so through your conversion process. And there are plenty of other doctrines which are shockingly in agreement with with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Another one, for example, is the concept of penance. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the books of the Damascus document and the community rule, there, you, if you did a certain sin, you had to fast from food or have reduced rations for a certain number of days or weeks or months, and um, you had to be excommunicated from fellowship for a certain number of days, weeks, or months. And sometimes it was a, a long period, like years, many years, you had to be separated. So. So we have this dual aspect, dual aspect of of penance, where if you do a sin, to be brought back into fellowship, you have to fast from food, and you have to be isolated from fellowship, not allowed to fellowship in the holy congregation, until your penance isolation is is finished. And we see this exact same thing in the Ethiopian Bible, in their extra books of the New Testament. In their Book of Clement, they have an Ethiopian Book of Clement, it gives a list of sins, and for each type of sins, it says, for this sin, this number of days, weeks, or months, or years sometimes, that you have to fast, and then this number of days, weeks, months, or years, that you have to uh, be isolated, from fellowship and not allowed to go to church, not allowed to partake of communion. So there are uh, other things such as the, the Ethiopian Orthodox, like the Essenes, believe that believers, even Christians who are not Israel, if they are part of the church, they are required to keep the Sabbath. They are required to follow the cleanliness laws such as eating kosher food. That's what the Ethiopian Orthodox believe is binding on all people. And also required to observe the cleanliness laws in general, such as if there's a woman menstruating, you are she is unclean and you have to purify yourself if you come into contact with her. And, there, and all the other specifications in, in the Law of Moses which the Jews kept strictly, and especially the Essenes kept, the Ethiopian Orthodox also keep it in the same level of basic strictness. So there's, there, and there's plenty of other stuff that just really 
solidifies the connection and the continuity between the Dead Sea Scroll religion and the Ethiopian Orthodox. So this YouTube channel is for the propagation of the Dead Sea Scroll religion, but it is not limited to the one moment in history that the Essenes were there. Because religion evolves over time, as we know, in the beginning there were no books of the Bible. Before the books of the Bible were written, the religion of the truth still existed, but almost none of the aspects which are later associated with the true religion are in it, in its inception from the beginning. So, over time, as events happen throughout history, things have to be addressed, and these things that are addressed then become incorporated into the true religion. So over time, the religion progresses. So at that moment in time, in the time that the Messiah came for us in the first century AD, when that happened, the the Essenes were a very specific way, and that was the religion, that was the truth. After this happened, the Messiah reformed the true religion, adding things, clarifying things, putting some things to a temporary stop, but not a permanent stop, but a temporary stop, and just, he greatly altered the way the religion is of, of the truth. But it's not a different religion. It's just a continuity shift. It, it, it shifts to a new understanding, but it's the same thread. In contrast, a lot of these other religions that claim to be uh, going back to the beginning, such as Protestantism, Catholic, or the Catholic Church, they unfortunately are not in continuity. Hold on one second. I just need to pause the video. So all basic Bible-based religions claim, make the same claim that they are threaded back to the beginning, but only the true group can make that claim with legitimacy. And that true group, I believe, is the Oriental Orthodox, and in more specif specificity, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. They are the only group which is faithful to the full understanding of, well, I'll clarify, not the full understanding, but the fullest understanding that any group currently has is with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So, I believe in my ministry, I encourage people nay, not encourage, but I implore you to convert at, eventually in your life to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. I have not yet done so. However, I have every intention on doing that when I am ready. And the reason I say that is because in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, you don't just join when you want to join. You join when you are holy enough to join. So that's why there's a three-year period because you have to learn the truth first. Now, the apostles in the extra books of the Ethiopian Bible do state that the leaders of the church can assess your progress, and if they see that you are doing much better and much quicker uh, purification and learning of the truth, they can skip the three years and make, make the process very quick. But for most people, they have a lot of baggage, spiritual baggage, and they need to be purified from false doctrine and false, uh, uh, not, but not false, uh, this is a false doctrine, um, sinfulness and impurity. They need to be purified from all that. So that's what the three years are for. Sometimes it might take longer than three years for some people who are especially unworthy and need greater purification or for people who are postponing their repentance and, and not doing the right thing and not pursuing repentance, it will take longer, obviously. So for me, I need to purify myself of the sins I have. Now, that doesn't mean 
you need to be sinless in order to join the church. Now we do, I do believe, and I will teach this on this YouTube channel, that you need to be sinless to be saved, to, to, to not die in your sins, to not have eternal death. You need to be sinless for that. You do not need to be sinless to join the church. However, you do need to be basically pure uh, to join the church. And so what that means is not uh, defiled in sins. Because you could do certain sins and not be defiled bodily. And there's bodily impurity that is grotesque. And these things especially have to do with the unclean food that you eat. So if you're, if you're living an unhealthy lifestyle or eating crap, you aren't able to join. If you are, you're not supposed to join. You're, you're, you're not pure enough to join yet. If you are, let's see here, if you are sexually impure, you're in, a, in adultery, you are in homosexuality, a number of these things, you need to be purified from that first before you join the church. These are things because, you see, joining the church is, 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 is like joining Israel, and you have to be holy. You have to purify yourself, sanctify yourself, set apart yourself. So, not be sinless, but not do abominations, essentially. So when you abstain from abominations, you are welcome to join the church. But until you abstain from abominations, you are not allowed to join the church. So, I'm not going to go into detail of my personal sins, but I have certain sins which I believe currently do not allow me in good faith to join the Orthodox Church because I am not holy enough and righteous enough. It's something I need to work on, and I, I will 100% definitely do it when I'm ready and when I feel like I have purified myself sufficiently. However, I, there are also some confusing aspects about this, such as Ethiopian Orthodox Church, there are very few Ethiopian Orthodox Churches in the entire world, especially in America. Um, there's like, I don't know the exact number, but I think there's less than 20 in the entire country of the USA. And in, in the North America and South America, there are also, like in, in total, there's still very few. So, and that happens in other countries too, uh, in other continents. So, unfortunately, in order to join the true church, you have to travel a very far distance. Actually, you have to move, essentially. You have to move away from your home, and that's a big commitment to make. And financially, a lot of people might not be able to make that commitment at, at their current point in time. There's also the possibility that, as I said, I believe currently that the Orthodox Church in general is legit the true church. But the Orthodox Church, uh, the Oriental Orthodox Church in general, because they're not uniform in doctrine, the other churches have some problems. Now, I need to pause the video one more time again. Hold on. Okay, so the other churches of the Oriental Orthodox, basically, their issue is that they do not believe in keeping the requirements of the law that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church believes. They don't believe in keeping the Sabbath. They don't believe in eating clean food, like kosher food. They don't believe that's required. They don't believe, uh, they don't believe that you have to be clean in order to enter church. They don't believe it's a sin to not purify yourself from uncleanness, as the law of Moses commands. So, my issue is if I was to join the now, so the Oriental Orthodox Church has other churches like the e Egyptian Orthodox, which is known as the Coptic Orthodox. 
also the Syrian Orthodox and the Armenian Orthodox and the Indian Orthodox. But those groups, the thing is, my problem is how can I fellowship with those groups if they are living in uncleanness, eating unclean food, not keeping Sabbath? I can't partake of that. So if I could, then I could join the Oriental Orthodox without having to move away. Because there's far more Orthodox churches in the Americas when you include all the other Orthodox churches. But when you limit it only to the Ethiopian Orthodox, it's much more rare and difficult to find such a church. So, that's my predicament. But I implore you guys to join the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. If you cannot join the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, consider the possibility of joining the Coptic Orthodox Church. However, as I said, I'm not 100% sure I'm willing to join the Coptic Orthodox because of their sin issues. Because I have to fellowship with them. And if I fellowship with them when they're living in sin, that, that harms me spiritually. So I don't know if I can do that in good conscience. But that's something you have to discern for yourselves. Because I do believe the Coptic Orthodox have true baptism authority. They can impart the true baptism that's required for your salvation. In general, there are exceptions to the requirement of baptism for salvation. But in general, the scriptures command baptism is required for salvation. Joining the true church, required for salvation. Of course, as I said, there are many exceptions to that rule, such as ignorance. If you are ignorant of the truth, you are not held to the same standard. So, with that said, uh, I do believe in joining the Eastern Orthodox Church. We need to join them. And that's what this YouTube channel will teach. That they alone are the faithful remnant of the Dead Sea Scroll religion. They are the continuity. Now, I would like to, at some point in the future, restore the Dead Sea Scroll religion in a fuller sense than the Ethiopian Orthodox are doing. Because while the Ethiopian Orthodox are great, they have some issues still that need correction. So I want to correct the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And the way to do that, I believe, is by joining them and then creating a split-off that does not create a separate denomination, but is still in harmony with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So if we could create an Essene Ethiopian Orthodox Church, an Essene Orthodox Church that is faithful to Ethiopian values, that is something I would definitely like to establish, because we need the true church. We need the Dead Sea Scroll religion in these last days. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church is great, but it's not doing enough. So I believe if we take the Dead Sea Scrolls Combine it with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. That's the faith. That's the religion. And once we go from there, so many amazing things will happen. We, there's a lot that needs to be done in these last days that we are living in. Many people may say, why is this product important to you? When Jesus, Yeshua, the whatever, the Messiah, is going to come back any day now, any year. Very soon, very soon, they say. Prediction after prediction, he's going to come back soon. Well, in my view, I have calculated, based on my understanding of scripture, he will come back in the 6,000th year after creation. So when is the 6,000th year, according to scripture? From my studies, I have concluded that the 6,000th year is well into the 22nd century around the year 2173 AD. So that is more than 150 years from now. Okay, more than 150 years away. So I believe there's 150 years of time left. With that much time left, my project is very important for these last days, I believe. Another thing is while lots of people have lived before us, more people are alive today than ever before in history. 
there are 7 billion people alive today. And in the next 150 years, that's going to increase dramatically. It's probably going to go up to 20 billion or more people. And that is, and, and through several cycles of deaths for generations, you're looking at more than half of all people who have ever lived are yet to be bored, essentially. You think about that. That's crazy. Uh, so, so the fact is that my Bible project will influence, will be there to potentially influence half the world that has ever lived. Half the population of all humans who have ever lived will be affected by me in major ways, I believe. So that shows that even though there's a small span of years, it doesn't matter about the years, it matters about the people. And there's a much larger group of people than ever before that will be in the next 150 years. So that's why this Bible project is so crucial and important for these last days. Because no time before has there ever been a, a time to, to influence this many people with the truth. So we need to bring the truth out, and that's what my YouTube channel is about. It's going to start out small, but eventually over time, it is my hope that it will really expand and really shape and transform the world to what it needs to be. So that's the basic gist here. Now, my Bible project is, is currently in preparation stages. Basically, the main thing I need to do is learn languages to a point of proficiency enough to reliably translate the Bible in a, in a timely fashion. So I want to learn better, significantly better, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Latin. Then you've got, uh, in line with Ar Aramaic, also Syriac. Now, some other languages that of importance, Ethiopian religion, I mean, not religion, sorry, my, my mind is a little messed up. Uh, Ethiopian language, which is known as Ge'ez. Then you also ha have, you have Coptic, the Eth uh, Egyptian language. Those are crucial languages for certain books of the Bible. And so I would like to learn those. And then lesser languages, but still of value, would be Armenian and Slavonic. I do believe those would be of value. And Arabic as well. Now, uh, so in line with Aramaic, it's Syriac, which is a dialect of Aramaic. And what's important about languages such as Arabic is that it will help me understand better the language of Hebrew because Arabic is related to Hebrew. It's a Semitic language, it's called. So a bunch of different languages are grouped together by scholars called, and they're called Semitic languages. That includes Aramaic, Arabic, Ugaritic, and Akkadian, and some others, such as Ethiopian, Ge'ez. Uh, that language is also Semitic. So when you study these Semitic languages, you see that they are basically related to a common ancestor. An original Hebrew that is the source of these Semitic languages. Over time, the split offs have become, have become corrupted with different elements. I believe, in many ways, Hebrew is the purest version, but Hebrew is still radically corrupted as well when compared to the original Hebrew. So I want to also reconstruct the original Hebrew, but that is a product that goes, I don't know if I will be doing that before I do the Bible Project. That might be something I do after I do the Bible Project. And, they, and there will be different stages of this. So I will probably produce the first edition of the Bible Project, and then I will create 
future editions to correct errors or, and enhance ideas based on new evidence, like new manuscript evidence, for example, perhaps new Dead Sea Scrolls, or new manuscripts of the Septuagint, or new editions published by scholars, which have new readings that I was not aware of. So these are things that I will be keeping in mind, and I will constantly be editing and updating this project. So eventually I would like to study other Semitic languages like Akkadian and Ugaritic in order to properly reconstruct the original Hebrew language that was used by Moses, by Abraham, by Enoch, those people. And I also would like eventually to create a school or academy for people to learn history from a unbiased perspective um, and also science to learn science to study other religions, because a lot of other religions have truth in them and are important to learn from. And there's just so many things that I believe I can help people with. Because it's not just the Bible. What happens if the Bible didn't exist? What would we do? Well, we would be like the animals. And we would be like the original followers of the Creator. There would be no scriptures because scriptures wouldn't be needed. Scriptures are not inherently necessary. They're there for our benefit, but not our requirement for salvation. So so script I will be doing this Bible project not because I think people need this Bible to be saved, but I think more people, significantly more people will be saved if they know the truth of what the true Bible says. But uh Beyond that, there's so much more to life in the Bible. So much more. So I don't want to limit this channel exclusively to the Bible. I also want to talk about life in general. And values. Family values. Pol politics. Studying history. Because history is so much related to the scriptures as well. But just to our self-identity. Scripture suggests that we should study history just for the sake of studying history. You get, it gives a genealogy of, of our forefathers in, in the Bible. Why? Because it's important for our identity. Not because it's important because it's Scripture, but it's who we are. So that is why studying the past is so important. That is who we are. That is who we came from. We learn from history that we can prevent mistakes from repeating, we can learn from the past, we can appreciate who we once were as a, as a society, we can refute false ideas by studying the past, we can help people become saved, but in general it's just fun to learn history and it really is valuable and it just expands your knowledge of the truth. And, and we are to learn things. Simply to learn things. It's important to learn things just because that's who we were made to be. To, to increase our knowledge. To increase our love. And to increase our power. Our ability. What do you think we'll be doing for eternity? In eternal life? We'll be just sitting there... Worshipping God all day long, doing nothing of meaning or value to us, just blindly, monotonously, mechanically, uh, you know, just in a dead zone, dead stare of worship? No. We will live like we live now. We will live for growth. That's what the eternal life is all about, growth. So, what will we do in eternal life? We will learn as much as possible. Why? Just because. Not because we need to learn something to be saved, but just because the past is important and we should learn it to respect it, to acknowledge its existence of what happened. And to... The, the more we know, the more we, we become like God. 
And that is what our goal is to be, as much like God as possible. So we learn as much, we increase our value. The more we know, the better we are. The, the more worthy of respect we, we are. And, this, and the same thing with, with, uh, uh, the other thing is learning skills and abilities. You know, learning languages. We could learn a million languages. Why should we learn all these languages? Because it expands our ability to communicate, expands our ability to learn and read and speak. We connect things in our mind when we know other, la other languages. We realize that what we're saying is very different or what other people say means something different than what they think it means, for example. It just brings so much greater depth to reality when you have a fuller understanding of language, for example. But learning languages just because, just because, it, it help it gives you greater abilities, and and building your muscle strength, exercising. That we will probably be exercising in eternal life. There's probably going to be physical activity of that sort, expanding your strength. We could have games in eternal life, contests, playing fun for fun. That is what it's going to be. And music. Why do music? We do music to enjoy music. There's so much amazing variety of music. And we can have eternity to listen to every song that ever existed. Now, of course, there's impure songs. But perhaps we could hear those songs in a way that does not defile us. Who knows? Because God hears every song. So it is conceivable that we could hear a sinful song and still find the value in it um, without it defiling us. Perhaps that can be an eternal life. I don't know. That's something, it's something to consider. There's all kinds of possibilities. Same thing. We might be able to see movies um, in eternal life. Who knows what the possibilities are in eternal life? So many things... And, and so many things we can't even imagine. Like, I have theorized the possibility that we will be able to share our thoughts and memories telepathically with other people who we want to show that to. And that will be a form of, of friendship and intimacy that we can give other people. Here are my thoughts, my innermost deep secret thoughts. This is what my life story is. Here's my life story. All my dark secrets that I ever did, every sin I ever did, I want you to know about it. Not everybody knows about it, but I want you to know about it. And I established a special connection, friendship to you and me that you, I have shared with you my deepest secrets. So that is something I believe we might do as well in eternal life. And so yeah, so that's why, so this uh, learning science helps us expand our abilities and progress as a society. Of course, with a lot of science is corrupting us as well, but knowledge can save and it can destroy, depending on how you use it. So the enemy is using knowledge to destroy the world. Let us counter the enemy by learning in the same way, but instead using our knowledge to save rather than to destroy. With that said, that, so that's what my YouTube channel is about, and I hope you enjoy what I share going forward. Uh, I hope this YouTube channel is a blessing to you, and please, if you like a video that I make, like it, press the like button, share it with your friends, people who you think might be interested, share it on Facebook, in emails, and contact me because I get very depressed and discouraged sometimes. I feel like I'm not making a big enough difference or impact in people's lives. If you have been impacted in a very positive way by something I've said, reach out to me, tell me. That's going to encourage me and help motivate me to make more content for you guys. So really just 
help support me either by wa by watching videos or donating your time or effort. You could join the cause. You could help me with my Bible project. There's so many things you can do. Share, uh, so please share the the these videos that I make with people who you think will be benefited from it. Even people who might be skeptical of it. It doesn't hurt for them to, to see it. Now, I tend to make long videos. I hope in the future to make shorter videos for people. That'll be difficult for me because I'm a long-winded person naturally, but it is my goal to make shorter videos for people to really be uh, able to view the content in a time-sensitive manner. You can also, on YouTube, there's a setting of speed of how quickly you can listen. You can listen 1.5 times, and I sound okay. I don't sound too fast when it's 1.5 speed. Two times speed is a little bit fast, but you can still understand most of what I say. So anyways, I keep going on here, so sorry about that. But uh, So that's what this uh, YouTube channel is about, and I hope you stay tuned. I'm going to be posting a lot more stuff soon. I'm going to try to post stuff on a regular basis probably, hopefully soon, once a week. But I can't commit to once a week yet, but I hope to do that eventually. Okay, guys, that's it. Shalom. God bless you guys, and have a wonderful week and a wonderful year. Peace.